You're listening to the Sketchnote Army podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. Hey, Mike Rohde here. I'm teaming up with Peach Pit to give away 10 prizes in the Sketchnote Handbook 10th Birthday Giveaway. It's easy to enter the giveaway. First, you follow Peach Pit and Row Design on Twitter. Second, retweet at least one Sketchnote 10th Birthday tweet from Peach Pit or Row Design. And here are the 10 prizes you could win. One coaching session with me for 30 minutes. Three signed 10th Birthday Edition Sketchnote Handbooks. Three Sketchnote Idea Books and Airship Auto Quill Fineliner 6-Pack Pens as a set and three Sketchnote typeface full desktop licenses. Visit rowdesign.com slash giveaway to see all the details. This contest runs from November 1st to November 30th, 2022, and is open to U.S. adults only. Entries must be received by 11.59 p.m. Eastern, November 30th, 2022, and winners will be announced on December 1st, 2022. See official rules at peachpit.com slash happy10. That's peachpit.com slash happy10. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, it's great to have Tim May from X-Plane on the podcast. Tim, welcome to the show. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much, Mike. This is a pleasure being here. I enjoy seeing you and your posters. Uh, it's, <laughs> it feels very much like home. Yes, yes. Uh, I know we've talked in the past about our shared interest in things like Star Wars and movies and music and such. So um, it's really great to have you on. Tim and I have known each other for many years. Um, and so I thought this season was the season to have Tim on. I don't know why it took so long. Sometimes I ask that about every season, but, you know, I can only do so many episodes a season and it sort of makes, makes it fun. So, Tim, uh, why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? Well, uh, among like, you know, being being a, a Mike Rody sketch you note know, fanboy, like, like that's that's <laughs> part of, you know, like 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 beyond that, um, I'm the creative director at Explain. Uh, Explain is a design consultancy, and we really use a lot of the power of visual design, sketch noting, graphic design, uh, information graphics to to help accelerate and and uh, and and move strategy forward for organizations and people. Um, we are kind of moving from just doing that specifically in consulting kind of like bespoke projects to starting to create tools and courses and lots of things that, that, that people can find. If you go to explain.com, uh, there's a lot of downloads and worksheets that people can use to sort of start to organize their visual thinking. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've been with explain for, uh, like 14 years since 08. It's been a very long time. Yeah. Uh, seemed like a different world back then. Uh, but, uh, but, but yeah. And, and so, so day to day, uh, I'm doing that. Uh, I, I am also, um, one of the world's greatest barf bag, uh, designers. Um, every time I fly, I try to just make a really beautiful, um, kind of movie poster out of the, uh, air sickness bag in front of me. Um, <laughs> In the past, I always left them for the next person to like. I figure, you know, hey, if you're going to chuck on a plane, you might as well have a picture to to enjoy while you do it. But but I've been I've been hoarding them recently because I kind of want to have a little bit of a show. I want to put the. I I think it'd be kind of hilarious to have an art gallery with a bunch of air sickness bags like that. Just uh, I think it'd be funny. Yeah, that'd be quirky. So you know, it's really interesting. A uh, friend of the show who was on many seasons ago, Ben Crothers in Australia, is also a barf bag illustrator. He um, hey. He does it too, so that you have a kindred spirit on the other side of the world. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think that it's so, some of us like like um, I'm not a productive airplane worker. I know people who are like, oh, I love flying because I get so much done. That's not me. <laughs> I'm, I am not productive on it. I think part of it is like you know being being over six feet tall and over two hundred mm -hmm. pounds just makes sitting in an airplane seat not not comfortable and not relaxing yeah. and so 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 to distract myself it's it's like taking on an art project every time i uh every time i do it <laughs> you need something to distract you from the discomfort i suppose right yeah and and hey ben crothers i believe that we are we are friends and follow each other on the instance so so but uh but there's a shout out for sure yeah and sort of a tidbit for those who may be aware of dave gray so dave gray is the founder of explain many years ago it's like 89 or something is that yeah it was it was from? 
it was a long time ago. Yeah, that, that, that I think I think we officially started in 93. 93, okay. It was somewhere in that zone. We, I'll put a link into, there's a really great interview, one of my favorite with Dave, um, where he talks about moving from newspapers and starting Explain and how strange it was at the time in the 90s because nobody like understood visual thinking or what, what you could do with it. And he, was, he had to convince people like to hire him and do stuff and... Um, so I'll put a link in so you can hear that if you are interested in context for how Explain came to be. But um, well, re- very well regarded company and they do amazing work. Um, so anyway, I'll stop talking about that and <laughs> let's get back to you, who you're the focus of this discussion. Um, so we know what you do. Tell us about, I, I always love the origin story. I want to know how did you end up being the creative dr- director at Explain? And I'm sure that there's been twists and turns in your story. And I would love to hear maybe from when you were a little kid, like when you were a little kid, did you draw a lot? Like start from that kind of time zone. Oh yeah. No, I, I was one of those um, ADD riddle and children of the eighties. Um, <laughs> just uh, very, very distracted uh, unless I was drawing. Um, and then somehow I could draw for hours on end and that didn't really like, like upset anything. Like I could keep, I could keep the focus if I, if I had a creative project that I was working on. Um, and so most of my math teachers told me, Hey, you should go into art um, that, uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, math may not be the path for you. <laughs> But they, but but my but my math papers when I turned them in were beautiful. I I, I went all in and making you know like, like just having a lot of fun with um, uh, colors and other things like like at an early age. I also kind of took an early interest in in um, the branding of items and shows and things. Like I I, mm-hmm. I really liked. Um, I, I had an early fascination with logos and. So, so sort of the the visual design of things. I, I kind of like spoofing things mm. uh, at an early age, kind of like a, a Weird Al Yankovic version of that product that you'd have. Like I I liked um, being able to to really closely copy the typography and design of that thing that, that that I saw, but then making like a you know sort of a stupid version of it that that would make me laugh. Mm. So that was you know that, that was one of my you know like uh, I, I was I and so so I kind of had an interest in in a lot of those elements. Uh, when I was young, but um, going sort of moving forward in life, uh, I became a a painting major and I I thought that I'd be a studio painter. I thought that I'd kind of put those things together as far as like being a a gallery artist who would uh, make these beautiful paintings and people would love them and they'd be controversial and we'd have the big art openings and people would eat the like the little crackers and the the, the carrots and the dips. and, and I, I got a studio, I graduated with my degree and I was sort of like, all right, let's make this happen. And I, I kind of quickly found that um, this is not the career for me. I'm a pretty social person. I'm, I'm pretty extroverted. I really like collaborating with people. And I, I kind of quickly saw that um, I was not the kind of person who's going to really flourish being in a studio all day working <laughs> on my own. On, on self-motivated projects um, that I, that I I felt like I was much better attuned to collaborating with people on on projects to kind of have um, to and and to working with other people and playing off other people um, that that just felt a lot more fun and interesting to me. Mm-hmm. So so with my freshly minted uh, like drawing and painting degree, I quickly and this was we're, we're talking like mid mid nineties late nineties. Taught myself the applications that were that were coming to the fore. So I, I learned Photoshop. I I learned um, you know Dreamweaver, uh, taking people back a little bit. But but some of those ways of being able to communicate in in sort of a uh, a visual manner, but but using the applications that were more for commercial application rather than fine art. Um, that 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 quickly sort of and, and the other thing that I sort of had imagined as a kid was like, you know, I want to be a part of that like cafe scene in Paris where the artists all hang out and they 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 discuss their ideas and they you know it's it's like 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 this amazing creative community and what i found very quickly was that like that community existed for um for online art and design in in mm. the sort of mid mid to late 90s um but you didn't have to be in a specific place right like like there was an online community that was already building around art and design where where there were forums and there were uh you know people were sharing ideas it was it was pre-twitter but it was a lot of the same ideas of twitter where people are sending out their work Mm -hmm. asking people to look at it looking for feedback and and so so these sort of fun art and design movements would go through the the sort of commercial design community online at, at at a much more rapid rate 
and and you'd have people in Tokyo influencing people from Berlin who are influenced by people from you know where I was working in Boston at the time like like it was just moving really quickly um and so so I I kind of um kind of pivoted my career and began doing um, art design. As I mentioned, I, I moved to Boston. Um, Boston was a really fun place uh, because there was just uh, late 90s. It was that first big tech bubble and everything was going insane and you couldn't get enough people. Like the job section of the newspaper was like this thick. And uh, and, and and it was, um, it was an exciting time to be kind of like young and coming into a career. Um, uh, all apologies for the present generations of like wondering like what the crap is going on here. Uh, but, 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 it, it, and, and so, so I was kind of quickly able to pivot to a job that, that was um, creating uh, like visual marketing materials in that sort of like in some of the fun constraints of the early web. Right. And what I mean by that is like, like, let's see 640 by 480 pixels was your screen size yeah you had 16 colors to choose from uh we were making little um you know animated things that had to be under 21k like <laughs> just like the, the the constraints were insane um but 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 by embracing those constraints you kind of learn like hey working with pixels is kind of like working with paint right like you blur your eyes and you kind of figure out like what the whole thing looks like together so so i was able to kind of like bring in some learnings from my from my painting career that 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 supplemented my like emergence as a designer and obviously i had to kind of take a crash course on typography and some of those other things that you need to know to be a designer a commercial designer um but but then uh as as i kind of moved forward in my career um I, I found myself working more on on kind of innovation projects and and work with with a team at Hewlett Packard that was trying to help this large slow company be more innovative in in the way they worked and and sort of it, it was kind of like a an introduction to consulting work where mm -hmm. where understanding how you turn people's strategic ideas into into products and experiences. Um, and, and I really enjoyed the kind of creative side of that. But while working at Hewlett Packard for a couple of years, I also felt like it was maybe sucking my soul away because it was such a big company. And there was just a lot of, um, you know, in any large company, there's a lot of protocol, right? You just have a lot of bureaucracy that you've got to navigate through. And the amount of change that you can actually make within the company is still kind of small, even though we were this cool, agile team that ate lunch in the same room every day. And it was, you know, that there was, there's, there were a lot of cool things about that group. Um, but then I kind of, I, I moved to Portland and there really kind of went from, from the kind of strategic design to just beautiful commercial design. So I worked with an agency called Curiosity um, and there met some amazing designers. It's always fun to work with people who are better than you mm -hmm. because that kind of helps you like, like see like, holy cow, this guy, this guy did that in an hour and a half, like got to up my game, man, got to yeah. get faster. Um, and, and, and then uh, finding explain was sort of the right mix of art design strategy collaboration. Um, like when, when the, Creative director explained, called me. He was like, look, um, I, I had just um, competed in the cut and paste tournament. And that's, this goes a few years back, but this was a tournament where they would give you a topic. They would share your, your screen, your desktop, and you had like, it's Iron Chef, right? You had mm -hmm. 10 minutes to create something beautiful and compelling for, for people to look at. It was judged and you would move through. And I had just won the first um, cut and paste competition in, in Portland. And this friend was like, what you're doing is actually pretty perfect for what we do at Explain because it requires real-time drawing and real-time illustration. And mm -hmm. so so that kind of sketch noting side of it was like, oh, this sounds kind of fun. And and as he described it, he's like, you know, what what we're what we're essentially building are really targeted information graphics on steroids to help organizations um, understand their strategy or take action around, you know, like their, their new process that they're trying to implement or, or help send out the culture to everybody so that they can see it and understand it. So, so as I, as I kind of um, started working with explain, it combined a lot of those things that I love, which, which I've recently been calling social art. Like I, I love that when, when people can work and collaborate around art, um, there's kind of an incredible um, level of alignment and trust uh, that, 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 that if you think of anybody who's come to you with, with a, a drawing that they've put together and said, hey, look at this drawing, you always consider it a gift, 
right? Like that's always a good thing to have happen. If you have somebody come to you with like their 20 page PowerPoint, that's all like big titles and bullet points. No one's ever considered that a gift, right? Yeah. That, that is that is more often than not thought of as a burden, um, and 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 so so I think that the this kind of social nature of art, the social nature of of the kind of designing things and sketching things and being able to share them with people, I really was drawn to that. I think the other thing that I was drawn to was in my agency life there was a lot of that pitching, right? Like mm-hmm. the sexy reveal. Here's yeah. this beautiful thing that you can like. Uh, you know, like, like, like look at and, and appreciate. Uh, and, and I felt like there's, there's nothing as naked and sort of sad uh, as, as doing those pitches and then like not getting the work. Right. Cause the last three weeks you were just like putting everything you had into that thing. And then you show it to them and it's not the thing they wanted. Well, at explain, we get ahead of that. We're working with the customer to figure out the thing that they need. And so there's never a moment of sexy reveal, right? There, mm-hmm. it's it's a collaborative process, process. and they're mm-hmm. they've co-created and they're bought in from the beginning. So I feel like they're they're kind of already bought in, and and there is that you know that sort of sad like pitching side of it. And so I I really feel like as, as I started working this way, I kind of saw a couple of things, and one is like this is the future, <laughs> like that that that, it, that that in organizations where there's sort of this bullying top-down culture that's going away (laughs) um the problems that we're facing need multiple people to be able to to solve them right you can't just do them on your own so so i kind of felt like this is this is the right place and and i guess that kind of bears out because i've been with explain since 2008 and haven't really sought to work elsewhere so it's worked out so far so good for me Hmm. wow that's really great That, that makes me think of when you talked about the pitch and working for three weeks that just brought me back to watching the show Mad Men. I think there was yes. one. There was one. I, I don't even remember who the client was, but they spent like all weekend. I think it was an airline. So the op, they had an opportunity to pitch. I think American Airlines, and so they everybody worked all weekend, and they came up with this really great thing. And the guys, they they sent the got not they sent the people who were like the number two people to come and like bear the bad news. So they basically had died before they even got to pitch it right so and it's you think about how how inefficient that is right where you you sort of have to you take this idea and you sort of you think you know and you sort of guess and you put it all together and you put all this effort in and if you miss like you miss big if you hit i guess then that's good but the i would guess the percentages are pretty low like worse than baseball percentages right of hitting you know, oh. un- under 300, you know, you're batting or something because you're guessing so much where if you have collaboration with the customer or the client, they're the ones that's driving it. So there is much part of it and everything is happening with their input, right? So the chances of it failing are much lower. I'm sure there's situations where budgets disappeared or somebody left a company or stuff like that happens. But I mean, it's got to be a lot lower. Is Am I perceiving that <laughs> the right way? Oh, totally. Well, and, and I think that that a lot of agencies are are what like three bad pitches away from closing the doors, right? Mm, yeah. Like, like there, there's you're you're so dependent on keeping those clients happy, and and you know what 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 happens in a lot of cases is the the clients end up more or less outsourcing their strategy to the marketing agency, right? That like like a lot of those companies are. And I don't think that's really healthy, right? That you're, you, they become so dependent on some of their their agencies mm-hmm. that they don't really have a lot of in house knowledge around how things are actually supposed to work. Mm-hmm. And and then when agencies become too powerful, uh, you know, that's never good, right? <laughs> right? When somebody yeah. has too much power. So so on the other side, that can happen. But I but I I really do think that um, there is yeah that 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 kind of pitching to people uh, can can get old real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 the other thing is. When you're co-creating from the start and you're 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 treating that client as the subject matter expert that they are, um, there there's more trust in in that relationship, and and the more trust you have with with the people that you're creating with, the more likely it is that your work's going to be really successful, right? That, that that we have and and that they're going to go to bat for you when it comes for them taking your work out to the organization, saying this is the thing we built together. Um, mm-hmm. So so yeah, I think that that's that's also a big part of it. I would guess that the also the intimacy, I guess for lack of a better term. So if your customer is as much on the hook for making this work as the agency is, they're going to be more open about, hey, like 
we can't do that because John and HR is not going to go for it. We're going to have to modify this, right? Or, you know, in the past we did something like that and it went really badly and there's maybe institutional bad taste in the mouth that might lead us away from that. You start getting this inside information to guide you around potential pitfalls. Um, but then also there's, you know, the skin in the game, whatever you want to call it, you know, participation <laughs> so that, you know, if they're, if they're going to pitch this, they need to look good. So there's like, you know, um, motivation for them to work and collaborate and come up with a good solution because they're the ones that are going to get stuck with it when your engagement is done. Right. So better to be stuck with something that you have planned and you know, is going to work because you can deliver it than something that you can't. Right. Oh, totally. And I think that that point that you made about the potential pitfalls is a really cool one. Um, a few years back, we'd explained designed a card deck game that is set up. It's it's called Barriers to Change. And and that's, you know, and, and so it's a little product that we built just for that scenario, because so often mm -hmm. when you have a big change initiative inside a company, um, people are, you know, like, like, you need to get those things out on the table so that you know what what your your plan's going to be, right? That, mm -hmm. that so often, it's really valuable to kind of have that pre mortem moment where you figure out like, hey, we're going to project two months into the future and say our project just totally tanked. Why did it tank? What went mm -hmm. wrong? <laughs> and and as you start to sort of bring those things to, to to the fore of like, well, we screwed up doing this and we screwed up doing this. And that, that was something, you know, and, 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 and that one guy had had too much power over this thing and we weren't able to get around it. Well, now you can start to manage by exception. Now, you know, that as you build your plan, you engage those people that, you know, are going to be your, your blockers, um, negative blockers, not in the football mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and the ones that are going to be your, your uh, sort of accelerators, make sure that they're, they're helping you move forward and that you're able to kind of have a plan around that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a cool point. I love pre the, I'm glad that you brought up pre mortems. I think that can be useful even in the smallest project. So if you're a yeah. sketch noter, that's good. Let's say you've been hired to do this one day event and you're going to go sketch note, it, let's say I'm just picking something out of the air. You could do a pre-mortem and say, well, what could go wrong, right? Um, well, I could forget my notebooks or my or my iPad could fall and break. Well, how can you prevent? Well, maybe you borrow a friend's spare and you take it with you if it's really important. So if the worst would happen, you would have a second one. Or you were planning to do it on the iPad, but you bring a notebook and a bunch of pens along. So if, God forbid, this thing, the iPad doesn't work for some reason, you can get out the pens and paper and do something. And worst case scenario, then you could go back to your studio or your home and redo it again. I mean, it wouldn't be ideal, but at least you would have caught the information so that you could deliver for the customer, right? So it's like looking in the future and looking at all the potential things that could go wrong. And as much as you're able, I mean, you can't, I mean, if the power goes out in the whole place and everybody leaves, there's nothing you can do about that, right? So, I mean, there's a limit to what you can what you can plan for, but there are certain things, certain contingencies that you could certainly prepare for so that when you get to that you would be prepared for it and wouldn't look you know wouldn't look bad for your customer yeah no and I, and I think that that's really like in in the sketch noting engagements that i've done i've tried to have that as a possibility right that, that like i have my preferred way that i want to do this um and then i have my sort of next best way that i want to do this yeah. and i bring the equipment for all of that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, and I think that can even go to like, um, as an example, years ago I was in Kansas City and I was doing a workshop and teaching people. We were doing collaborative stuff with people. And we got near the end of the day and the, the organizer came around and said, hey, people are sort, sort of losing focus. Is there anything you have in your bag of tricks that will get people reengaged and talking? And I, did, and I didn't really have anything planned, but I started looking around and said, hey, there's all these rolling whiteboards around. Why couldn't we use those? So we group people in past groups that they were in, were in, we put them around these whiteboards and said, I just made something up on the fly, which was, hey, I'm new to Kansas City. Where should I go for barbecue? I really like barbecue. You group, group number one, you go tell me all the great places to have barbecue or other things. So me as a visitor can like go to the right places. So I get insider information. So each group did their own whiteboard. And then we just had like a gallery where we all walked around the whiteboards and looked at them. And it was totally on the fly, but again, you know, have, being open to like making something up and being willing to, maybe it wouldn't work. It turned out to work. But that became kind of a staple activity that we would do with groups, right? Because whatever, wherever you're going to, 
there's always like secret insider stuff that the people that know can share with the people that don't know. And it makes for a fun experiment. People had to work together. You know, some some had a bunch of people working on the same board. Some had a scribe that they assigned and they were feeding information. And so it was really fun to walk around and see how these how did these different groups each take the challenge and do it in their unique way. So that's another way to do it is sort of an openness to when things kind of go the wrong way instead of like freaking out is to take the opportunity to think, well, what, what do we have? What do we have laying around that we could turn into something, right? And that can often be a benefit to sort of this awareness of what's in your, what's, what is within your control that you can do. And that's a good mindset to have. Oh yeah. And, and I, I love the way you described having a bag of tricks. Um, I think that there, there are activities that you kind of need to have on, on hold, um, you know, particularly if you're working with a group of people and you're there in person, mm-hmm. um, the energy is going to flag in the afternoon. Like that's just, that's how people work, right? Yeah. You have your lunch, you get back in and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, and, and there was one um, uh, uh, group that we were working with. This was, this was actually for Red Bull. And what was fun about this was that we had all of these sponsored athletes, like really competitive wakeboarders and slackliners mm-hmm. and uh, trickers. You know, there's like, like, you know, really fun niche sports, handballers. And, uh, and, and in that afternoon stretch, we stopped and we did, uh, and, and please steal this because this is one of the best like energizers ever. We played competitive rock, paper, scissors. And I don't know if you've ever done this, <laughs> but the way it works is you go up to the nearest person, you do your rock, paper, scissors, you throw, you know, it's like boom, boom, boom. And then if you lose, you have to become the person you lost to's biggest cheerleader vocally. And so so you start cheering for the person you lose to. And pretty soon you just have two people with massive crowds of people cheering for them <laughs> for that final piece. And what was great about it was the sponsor raised the stakes and said, oh, and by the way, Winner gets $2,000. Wow. And so so it became the most competitive game of rock, paper, scissors you've ever seen. And you can imagine after that moment, people were amped, right? People were so like juiced. It was like, all right, let's go. Um, Cause somebody just won $2,000. It was, it was like, wow. and uh, so, so yeah, I, I do think that like those little energizer exercises, you've got to have some of those and, and pivot exercise, other things that you can do when you know that, um, people, you know, are, are flagging. Another one that I like just as a, as a, as a thought is um, when we're teaching visual thinking, uh, we'll often sort of go with that. Um, here's the most simple way to draw a human figure. And we go with like the box for the body, the mm-hmm. circle for the head, some lines for arms, some lines for legs. Now, everyone partner up and you have to have your partner make three different poses and you draw them using the box version of the person. And, and you're having people, you know, like, here's the bow and arrow, here's the, you know, and, and that's another good, it's like, like getting people up and moving around is such yeah. a great way of, of, of generating that, that sort of uh, interest and intensity. Hmm. Well, in, in this, in this moment, I'll pitch uh, a book that Dave Gray again, and uh, Sonny Brown, and um, I can't, uh, I can't remember the third person did game storming. James, James, James McAnufo. McAnufo, James McAnufo. Sorry, James, if you're listening, I knew your name. It just wasn't coming to me. But if you're in this space where you're having to work with people and you need a bag of tricks, game storming can be your bag of tricks for sure. So um, just a little pitch for that. Um, Absolutely. So Tim, tell us what, what are some interesting things that you're working on now that you can talk about that you're able to talk about? That's not like under NDA or whatever. Yeah, um, I I think that right now I, I've got a fun mix of projects, some wrapping up and some ramping up. Um, so just did discovery recently with a online music university. I probably can't use their name, mm-hmm. but um, but but they are really looking to kind of visualize what their their kind of five year strategy is, where they're going in the next five years, mm-hmm. and um, and working with musicians is just such a gas. Like like they. There was, um, you know, after some of our work, they had a jam session and, uh, you know, I, I, I kid you not, like like the guy who was just there, like sitting next to me, seemed pretty mild mannered and, and cool and just kind of working on the progress of figuring out our vision, shredded some Eddie Van Halen solos like I've never wow. heard, like, 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 like all of a sudden there's like a a full on like Van Halen tribute band and uh, and they were legit like. Wow, it was it was really fun, um, but but really, I mean, the the, the project we made a m- 
like it was the first project that I'd done in person in a while. And mm-hmm. it was really fun to see the amount of progress we made in a short amount of time mm-hmm. being in person. Um, I love hybrid and I, I work mostly hybrid and that's where how most of us are working now. But it was fun to see that energy in the room again. And the way that, you know, for, for most of our online meetings, uh, it's hard to pay attention on Zoom for more than what, like two hours max, yeah, right? Yeah. But like, like that's where people are going to j- just like tap out, say that's good. When you're in the same space, we had two back-to-back, you know, seven hour meetings um, and the energy didn't really flag. Like, like you kind of forget that it's like, oh, we're in the same space accomplishing something together. This is really, you know, th- there's like a really fun um, k- kind of, um, you, you have, it's a different kind of energy and 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 a different kind of work um and, and obviously for for hybrid you need to have the same bag of tricks that work differently mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. That, that, that you've got to remember like pacing things that people really can only concentrate for about you know 45 50 minutes at a time then you need to give them a break and mm-hmm. uh and and then you know as they come back some sort of activity to bring them back into focus um you know icebreakers are so critical anyway um so 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 that's um i'm, I'm starting uh, at the same time, there's some work that I'm doing with Explain that's around um, some of our training opportunities. So I recently put together uh, a course on s- storytelling for change is the title of the course. Mm. Um, and and it was really fun researching and putting the content together for that. It's sort of a hybrid course where part of it is video and then part of it is in person. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really fun kind of ramping up in in helping people look at their storytelling, not so much from like a, an outline, like here's the title, here's the content, here's the, but more from like a, here's a set of images that represent my story. Mm. How is the action happening along the, the the sort of curve of the action as they go through it? And and what are some ways that we might sort of tweak the story arc to be able to to better deliver on on the giving a sense of conflict and a sense mm. of of you know that that sort of like um you know those kind of classic storytelling elements that are important. Right. right. Uh you know hitting the climax, the you know the sort of the denouement, the the follow up after that. And anyway, so 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 that's one of the things that I've been working on at Explain that's been a ton of fun. Um and and then of course uh, you know, uh, as the creative director of the organization, I have a design team. There, there are four of us designers full time, and then uh, a series of illustrators and other um, experts that we work with, other designers in as far as our network goes out. Um, uh, and so, so I'm I'm kind of keeping those fires burning, uh, as well as just you know some of the other stuff that happens when you're on the leadership team in a company. Um, so, so yeah, I uh, and 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 I I will occasionally do. Um, in the last year, I've done some really enjoyable um, sketch noting uh, projects where I've done both webinars and in person um, kind of graphic recording uh, type mm-hmm. type gigs, uh, and and that's also been fun uh, doing some of that in person again. Um, it's been I've I've done some of that virtually and some of that in person, but that's also a, a little part of it. And I'm the father of three kids, so you know. Just uh, that that's probably my my number one focus. All the rest of it is is uh, just, you know, like keeping the wheels turning. But uh, I do feel um, kind of hashtag blessed that, that I get to do a job that I love uh, for the most part. And uh, and and that, the, you know, that, that, that I've found this career path uh, from from my original plan as being a fine art painter to to becoming uh, kind of a, a visual thinker, sketch noter, teacher, uh, creative director. That's really great. It sounds like you've really found your niche to kind of do all the things you love to do. That's really, really encouraging to hear for sure. This episode of the Sketchnote Army podcast is brought to you by Concepts, an infinite, flexible, creative tool for all your good ideas. Available on iOS, Windows, and Android. The new Concept 6 for iOS has exciting new features, including a modernized Canvas interface, a freshly structured, easier to use gallery that integrates with the iOS Files app, and RGB and HSL color options added to its already extensive Copic color palettes. Concept's Infinite Canvas lets you spread out and sketch in any direction. Draw and take notes with liquid pens, markers, and brushes in your favorite colors. Everything you draw in Concepts is a flexible vector, so you can move your notes around the canvas or change their color, tool, or size with simple gestures. Drag and drop images onto the canvas and use layers and grids to organize your creative space. When you're ready to share, export straight to your friends or team. 
Search Concepts in your favorite app store for infinite, flexible sketching. So I'm going to shift now. Let's talk a little bit about your favorite tools. We'll start with analog and then we'll go to digital. So that's like pens, paper, uh, notebooks, um, paint, I guess. You're a painter, so maybe you can recommend paint to people that want to learn how to paint. I don't know. Um, all those all those kind of things you physically work with that aren't digital. Yeah. So, so th this is kind of a funny one. Um, by far, my favorite marker is these giant, mm. thick, king-size metal sharpies yeah um and and what i like about them is that it's really easy to get like a good you know the the, the tip is that really oh, big yeah. chisel right yeah. and so so having the chisel i i can make you know i i can really vary the weight of the lines by quite a bit just by mm. sort of um moving the the edge Turning. of the chisel yeah. over right yeah so so by so by going from one side to the other um I kind of have that painterly ability mm -hmm. to 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 do sketch notes with with a lot with with kind of that varying um, line weight that 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 can sort of take it from from being a simple sketch to something that feels like oh wow how'd you do that right mm -hmm. um, so so I do think that like you know I, I mean I I still have plenty of the of the old regular uh, markers the other thing that I've been using um, and and this is kind of funny for for the canvas that I I've been using most frequently when I um, I'm just doing things for for personal pleasure and fun is the air sickness bags that you find on Alaska Airlines. They're not all marked up. They're not branded. They're just white. It's like it's such a beautiful canvas to do things on. I feel like, you know, I, I think when when Keith Herring, the the, the uh, artist, um, found that in these uh, subway platforms in New York City, when they take the poster down, there's this beautiful black canvas. And I think he originally was working with like chalk and that was like his thing. I feel like that's that's my barf bag, right? That's my Keith Haring moment is like, okay, Alaska Airlines has the best barf bags of any of the uh, of, of the commercial flyers because they're they're made out of um, that kind of somewhat uh, resistant uh, substance for the surface, right? It's 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 coated and, yeah. and the coating means that, that, that it's a little bit forgiving if you if you screw up, uh, you know, I, I can take my big black Sharpie and, and, and Sharpie over it. Um, the, the other thing that I like to use with those are the Posca markers. Oh, yeah, um, that they're they're really opaque. Uh, and, and so that, that opacity gives, uh, some of the work that I do kind of a screen print look. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I certainly enjoy that. And then obviously having a mix of, of kind of opaque markers and then, you know, like, like some of the silly, um, just like, uh, you know, like, like pink markers that, 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 uh, you know, having bright colors is important when you're doing a lot of graphic recording, um, in real time. Uh, the part of what I'm often doing is listening to five or six leaders in an organization um, discuss what they see as the the kind of future state they're trying to build. Mm -hmm. So so as they do that, I'm I'm often, you know, I'm I'm rapidly drawing and trying to kind of get the picture right of, of what they're saying. Um, and and the 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 graphic isn't as often left as like a beautiful visual artifact for them to kind of enjoy as it is a means to get on the same page. So, mm -hmm. so once they see what I've drawn, they kind of, I, we, I show them the drawing and then they're like, all right, what do you think of this? Um, you know, how, how would you change it? Um, this is another one of my favorites, actually. Um, this kind of looks purple, uh, but the color of this one is just like a really bright, almost fluorescent pink. Huh. Um, so as an accent color, um, when, when we're using it with, with our, our, our work, um, oh, yeah. it just has a really good, like, um, it has a good coverage, um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, it, it's kind of got the big blunt rhino tip nose. Uh, so it's just kind of squishy. So, mm -hmm. so using that with my black marker, putting them together, um, most of the time I'm using the, the, the large, um, white sticky notes, the, the mm -hmm. 3M, uh, the, the stickies that you'll, you'll buy, uh, that are, that, that we can kind of use in a room. So whenever I'm in person, that's, that's what I'm using analog, um, I do have, I, I've been doing some gouache and other things. I've, mm -hmm. I've been like, I, you know, I've got like, uh, I've been wanting to kind of get some like children's book illustration stuff going. Uh, so, so that, that, that's like one of our little, you know, side hustle things that I'm, I'm, I'm ramping up on and, and trying to move forward with as well. And with that, I'm, I'm still using like gouache and watercolor um, and then mixing that with some digital. Hmm. Yeah. Gouache sort of reminds me a little like a Posca marker got that yeah. same flat kind of look to it right it's a flat bright color yeah it almost totally. looks like it could have been silk screened on the surface if you use it in, in that way 
Yeah. Oh, and shout out to the people at Idea Inc. They were the ones who inspired me. I, I connected with them because I saw some of their um, sketch notes for for some of the work that they were doing. And I was like, man, that's that's good. And so I asked them, I said, hey, what markers are you using for this? So that was how I found out about them. Um, and so so that was that was where I, I, I learned about it. But I, I've always been impressed with any time I've seen something I've, I've admired or appreciated in, in our industry, how generous people often are. Yeah, I um, agree. That there's a, a really well-known sketch noter. Um, you might've heard of him and we asked him to do a, a project with us about uh, eight months ago and he was very willing to do it. So thank you very much for doing that, Mike. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> I think that there is the generosity. There is definitely something about the community that there is a generosity and a um, sharing mindset in it. I think for the most part, at least that I've encountered. I mean, I've been doing this for over ten years, and I haven't run into any resistance. So I think that's a mark of the community, which is a good thing to be marked by. I think. I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So what about digital? Um, you mentioned you sort of hinted at digital and sort of using a hybrid where you do maybe gouache and then digitize it. I guess from a photo, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Talk yeah. a little bit about that, that, that hybrid and then also pure digital stuff that you like. What are some of the tools you use there and how you using them? Yeah. So, um, the, the, the kind of the sketch noting conference that I did most recently, um, I, I've been using some of the Wacom tools. I really, really love my, my new best friend is my Wacom Cintiq Pro. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's like a, a 15 inch or something like that. Mm. It's, it's not super large. Yeah. Um, but the screen is gorgeous. Mm. Uh, I actually use it as a, as a third screen, um, when I'm not drawing on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, um, it works wonderfully for when I'm doing, um, when I do webinars, I kind of go all out and create really beautiful illustrated, um, kind of boards in Adobe Illustrator. Mm -hmm. And then I use the Adobe Illustrator drawing tool with the uh, with the Wacom uh, uh, pencil, pen, whatever they call this thing, uh, stylus. Uh, and and so, um, so I really enjoy that as sort of my, whenever I'm um, doing live sketch noting or that kind of work, that's sort of my, um, that's my go-to. And I really, mm -hmm. I really love um, I, I'm usually using Adobe Illustrator with that because it's um, I can I can have a lot of control over the colors. I can you know sort of go full screen, and so you hardly see any chrome of of uh, mm -hmm. of, of the application. And and then I I, I will kind of just uh, drag my way from left to right across the the, the work that I've kind of prepared and mixed mm -hmm. my hand drawn notes in real time with what I've sketched beforehand. So it's sort of a, a nice. Uh, pastiche of of uh, visual goodness as we go through it, mm. um, and that also is is uh, when, when I'm doing live graphic recording, I try to have a color palette picked out for for each speaker, and mm -hmm. so that I have like a really good. I'm not just like grabbing for what consistent colors I'm going to use. I also have a few preset brushes um, because I come from like a, a painting background. I like being able to have a brush that has varied um, width based on pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so being able to have that kind of like ink, like stroke as I draw, um, I like having that with, with the, 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 um, Wacom tablet, uh, Wacom is also a client that, that I I've, um, done a couple of webinars recently with them. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I, I realize that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally like uh, bought and sold by them. It's I'm, I'm a sellout <laughs> totally. Um, but, but at the same time I do, um, also for personal work, I often use my iPad um, and, and the iPad pencil. Um, I know Procreate is really common, but it's an awfully good application considering how cheap it is. It is. Um, and, and the pencil for me, um, I, I enjoy the kind of glassy feel of, of the tablet uh, and the way that I can do it while I'm just curled up watching TV with the family. Um, it, the, the, the super portability of that is very cool. Um, I will say that the latest generation of, of the Wacom um, tools, one of the things I appreciate is they used to, it used to be kind of heavy to get it to connect mm -hmm. to your system. Yeah. Uh, the latest one is just a USB-C in, a single wow. uh, input. And so so that that does make it uh, a, a little bit lighter footprint for for being able to connect and, and work that way digitally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so so I think that those are, those are the primary tools that I'm using for, for that kind of work. Um, the, the other thing that I do actually quite a bit recently is as I'm trying to define what it is I'm doing, uh, so often that there's that kind of discovery phase where you need to get the ideas out and get it sorted. Um, I use the app Mural online, M-U-R-A-L. There's also Miro that accomplishes a lot of the same things, mm -hmm. but shared 
uh, virtual whiteboards are kind of a godsend in the sense that um, when I started to explain, what would often happen is the room is the whiteboard. We use all the walls. We, we mark it up yeah. and we make this amazing mess. But then you have to break it all down and you take a few pictures of it, but it, it, it doesn't always last, right? You want to go back to that room. Right, right. And the fact that you can have this digital room with all of your inspiration and all of your idea, it's so easy to pull in everything you need. Um, I really love that tool as as a way of working. Mm -hmm. And and what, what I found is that like the first time I saw it, it's like, oh, I could use it for this and this. And then as I dipped back into it and really got got working with it, now I kind of use it for everything. Mm. <laughs> so so I probably have gone overboard in the digital whiteboarding, but but I really um I can't recommend enough um if you're you know as you're planning a project, whatever it is, um like using your sticky notes and 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 pulling in pictures and other things like that, like using that whiteboarding um, tool as a method of clarifying your thoughts mm -hmm. so that before you begin, you have a little bit of a game plan and, and you know where you're going. Yep, but it can even be used iteratively, right? So you could start with something and you get pretty close and then you duplicate that canvas and then modify it further. And so you could, and you can keep all of them, right? So you could actually go through your iteration and see, oh, I see. Here's where it shifted and changed, and you can see the progression if if you want to use it that way. Yeah, in fact, one of the things that, that I really enjoy about it when I'm working with our clients is we'll set up, you know, oftentimes the deliverables that we put together for our clients are a single image. Like we're trying to capture mm -hmm. the, the the story of the vision in in a single graphic. And we'll put that, you know, it used to be that we would present that from a uh a presentation and we take live notes on the presentation to kind of show mm -hmm. like, all right, we're going to change this. We're going to change that. We're going to change this. What's kind of fun now is just inviting them to the canvas with the graphic on it. And then we'll have a series of pluses and deltas. That's kind of a part of explain culture, but plus is, you know, here are the things that we like about this. Delta is really about change, right? What would we change from what we currently see? We're not trying to rip it to shreds, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but having them there to sort of start to, add their pluses and deltas and make notes on the canvas without me directing it. I feel like mm -hmm. that, that we get a little better feedback um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of opening it up for people to kind of see and react on their own. Um, I, I, I'm a pretty good narrator and, and I'm, I'm, I, I like to guide people through the work and I think it's kind of fun. Like, all right, here it is. I'm going to give you guys three minutes of really quiet time to look and reflect. And then we're going to start to, to, to add our feedback there and once again, right, as they add it in the virtual canvas, it stays there and I can refer back to it so that as I move forward, I have um, credibility behind my design decisions. So mm -hmm. I, like I made this decision because we had four, four or five people comment that this felt uh, out of place or this wasn't quite telling the message we wanted it to tell. And mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that, 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 that it works very well in, in collaboration. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, that's another great tool. That's, thanks for sharing that as well. So let's shift away to um, tips. I love the tips portion of the of the podcast because we always get the wisdom of guests um, for those who are listening. So the way I frame it is, imagine there's someone listening, they're into visual thinking, whatever that might be, sketch noting, graphic recording, maybe aspiring to those things. Um, they feel like they've reached a plateau, like they, they love it, they're getting into it, but they feel like they've reached this plateau and they can't on their own sort of bump to the next level, whatever that next level might be. What'd be three things you would tell that person to encourage them to go to the next level? Yeah. So I think that there are, there are a few things that I think are, are valuable. One of the first ones is um, be fearless in your pursuit of drawings to help understand. Mm. So, so what, what I mean by that is um, I kind of mentioned at the top of our, our discussion if you have a um, if you have an idea, don't worry about the quality of the drawing of your idea before you share it with people. Mm -hmm. um, take that take that sort of raw, sketchy version of your idea, and and bring that forward as the thing that you share, because what what will inevitably happen is people will see that it's sketchy, and they'll know that it's like, oh, this is not finished. I can mm -hmm. I can mess this up. And it's not that there's no threat to me here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I think that there's sort of like the first tip is like believe in the value of of incomplete or sketchy work um, as as a tool for for collaboration. I think that that's 
um, that, that, that that's that's a, a great way to move forward. Um, and and that, that as you and, and share that with people and ask people for feedback, um, that, that, that that's that's another kind of thing to keep in mind as you move it forward. Um, the next thing that, that, that I think about is, as I, I think about working this way, um, there's, you know, as, as, as you're dealing with capturing images and trying to kind of um, quickly visualize things, um, don't put pressure on yourself to make them beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's, there's always, it's always better to kind of um, think simply and, and give a simple version of the thing you're trying to draw as opposed to you know, getting all the filaments in your light bulb right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there and and that the, that there's um, that that abbreviating your work. A, a lot of times that that when we're doing um, graphic recording at Explain, we're we're really trying to do it in in real time and trying to to you know instead of make it look totally perfect to to be anatomically correct, mm -hmm. we're trying to get the gesture right. And so we'll often use that kind of Egyptian perspective where the head is in profile and the arms are yeah. you know the shoulders are forward and the, the, the that that sort of like um, so it's okay to abbreviate um, as you're as you're working on your your ideas. Uh, and and sort of keep simplicity in mind, uh, and and that 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 still can have just as dramatic an effect as a a lushly illustrated piece. Like I think that there there's definitely a time to kind of go deep and and get all the details right. Um, but oftentimes in 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 this the, the kind of sketch noting world, you're 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 trying to get it quick. You're trying to get you know you, you want to summarize their ideas and turn them around very quickly. Um, so I'm trying to think of what's the best third piece of wisdom. Um, as I'm thinking about that, can we have a moment of silence for the Choco Taco? Um, <laughs> yes, I saw that. That's going away. It's why it's go. I, I, you know, I, I was never really, I, I don't think I've had a Choco Taco in at least 20 years. Um, but the fact that they're gone makes me miss them. <laughs> it's like, that I, I think, you know, I've, I've spent some time in Europe and I, I, I feel like, you know, when I'm in Europe, and I, I haven't had something like a corn dog for, uh, you know, six months. It's like all of a sudden a corn dog sounds really appealing. Now I don't go for corn dogs necessarily. Like that's right. not my jam, but, but, but the idea that I can't have one all of a sudden means, Oh, I got to get one. Um, it's funny how that works. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I would say the, the last thing in kind of bumping up uh, skill sets and work is um, one of the things that's helped me is just going out and find a class in a thing you're not good at to help yourself get better because there's so many good classes out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that, that, that we often, um, you know, hey, we're designers. We can design our way out of anything. We can figure out a solution to this problem. And there's somebody else who's done it better than you, probably teaching a class in it right now. Um, and and the, the number of offerings that are out there, I, I just feel like um, it's it's important to know that, that you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and, and so go find one of these people um, like Mike, who's offering a course in this, that's going to help you move, move up in, in that area, right? That, that there's, you, you can always get better. And, and that mm. one of the things that often happens in these courses, that's really almost as valuable as the instruction that you get from the instructor is the forums that they set up. So in a recent course um, that, that I took, there was a Facebook community that was set up and it was a really big community. There were a lot of people in that course. And I quickly found that, that um, the more I participated in that community, I was getting really good personal advice mm. from some of these people who are very well established uh, in, in this, in this sort of direction I wanted to go. Mm. And, uh, and, and that was sort of, um, you know, what, once again, like, um, people are going to be generous if you can connect with them, but sometimes you need to find the right forum to do it. Yeah. So, so I think that as, as you're continuing to learn, um, you know, do a lot of practice, keep your sketchbook, do all those things that are, that are sort of going to be natural, right. That, that, you know, you, there, there've probably been 20 people before uh, on your podcast who have said, while you're in a meeting next time, bring your sketchbook, draw along to the ideas that you're hearing, right. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that, that's, that's a very good first step. But I think that, that, that another step of just like, take one of these courses that's available to you and, and, and use that as a, as a way to start to write, but really build your skills and build your personal community. Right. So the other thing is that you, you meet people who will continue to respond to, to your, uh, you know, connection request and, and they'll be able to help you as you move throughout your career.
Mm, those are three great tips, Tim. That, thanks for sharing those with us and encouraging us with us. I, I think anyone can take those. I, I was encouraged by them myself, and you've encouraged me to start looking at some courses this year that I could take. I think it, probably the other thing that's nice is have, reminding yourself uh, that there's an opportunity for a beginner's mind where you don't know anything and you can start from zero is really valuable to see what that feels like um, so that, you know, you see that progression over time and it helps you have empathy for those who are maybe are starting and also have that feeling, right? So you can have your connection with that experience and remember what it's like, especially for, you know, someone like me who's done a lot of stuff. It's good to be reminded of those things. As well. Yeah, I was just thinking, Mike, how how um, in the course of our work over the time, we sort of have a a font that is the way we we do our lettering, yeah. right? And and that that's we do it because it's it's quick and and that that's just sort of a part of how we work. But you think about how many people out there make really gorgeous um, like hand lettering. Uh, you know, custom designed uh, typefaces. Uh, uh, typeface isn't the right word, but it's it's lettering, right? It's hand lettering, um, and and that there there are so many good courses in that now, right? That like, mm-hmm. you know, you think about um, just twenty years ago, it was hardly a thing, and now it's a huge thing. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many people you could learn from. Um, that that I I feel like like um, in sharing this, I've already inspired myself to to want to go and and take one of those courses and mm-hmm. and uh, put myself in that learning mindset again, so so that I don't. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's part of it is, is keeping your ideas fresh, right? Not always relying on the same tools that have got you there. Like, like we need to always mm-hmm. be constantly innovating and coming up with new ways of doing stuff. Yep. Yep. Well, Tim, tell us where are the best places to find you, uh, websites, social media, uh, if someone were to want, want to reach out or see your work. Yes. So my Instagram is at fresh beast. If you can get past all the recommendation engine <laughs> problems and like yeah videos and other things that, that, that take you away from it but but yes at fresh beast and that's also my twitter um so i i i tweet occasionally uh i the, the, the um but but you'll you'll find um the instagram's got a lot to it um my my sort of like I, i've i've had the same job for so long that my online web presence really <laughs> needs to be improved right now um that is also my website but i think right now it just defaults to a weird flicker page so don't go to to freshbeast.com um for for another week or two i'll i'll try and try and make that look a little more presentable <laughs> as i i need to clean that up um but but then uh and then then my company explain xplane.com um, that's, that's, uh, my, my consultancy and that's where I'm, I, I do, um, the, the group through which I do, uh, you know, all my day job and all my work and all my courses and everything else that, that, uh, I'm involved with. And, and you can get, get a sense of, of, of what we do there. Um, just, just as a hint, it doesn't look sketchy. Um, oftentimes our, <laughs> our clients are people operating out of the C-suite of large organizations yeah. and, and it's, you know, we, baby steps for them, right. That they'll, they'll eventually start drawing once they kind of catch the vision of it. But if they see the first thing is a bunch of hand-drawn sketch notes, they're sort of like, that scares them off. So don't, don't be scared off by the beautiful polish of our website. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just to kind of like, you know, we, we know who our audience is. We're trying to connect with them that kind of thing. Speaking, speaking the corporate language, which is important in your that's right your company's position. And the thing that you mentioned early in the discussion that I'll remind people of is tons and tons of templates and um, recordings and things that you can check out at explain.com. So definitely do that. Go check out all the stuff that's available and on offer over there because there's a ton of it. Probably, probably more than you can get through. Uh, by the end of the year, so I, I think we we actually pared down our our blog because it was one of the the first um, corporate blogs that was done. Like, like you know that Dave Gray was pretty forward thinking back in the day, mm-hmm. um, and we we had to pare it down because it was slowing down the entire performance of our <laughs> website because we had blog entries from the nineties um, that that were not necessarily you know we we, we decided to make a little bit of a cutoff point because we were just like. There were there's just so much, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. so yeah, you could but you can dig deep there. There's a lot of good stuff to find. Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely. Well, Tim, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom and telling us your story. Um, uh, thanks so much for all that you're doing in the community. I know that you do a lot of teaching. We've worked together, and I really enjoy having you in the community. So thank you for all you've done. It's been great to partner with you and just see you do cool stuff. Oh, hey, it's an honor to be on your podcast. Let's go sketch note army. Yes.
Until the next episode, this is Mike signing off. See you then. The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or go to peachpit.com and use the code RODY40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show.